Israel Nishman is a man of many parts with an exceptional range. He's an artist. He's an ultralight pilot whose remarkable feat of teaching a small flock of endangered whooping cranes to fly with him back to Florida was made into a movie, The Winged Migration. Yeah. And he's an environmentalist and a self-taught architect who's built a fascinating roundhouse, most of it underground, which I was privileged to visit. It's an enchanting place. He's an enchanting man. Bill Lishman. Pleasure to be here. Uh, this, I, I was here in 2001, and, and uh, I says, I, Idea City. I'm known for ideas, and uh, actually, uh, Jeff Daniels, who played me in Flyaway Home, said, with me, ideas are a verb. I have a lot of ideas, and I'm, I want to show you the, the uh, just run through a few and end up with some of the ones that really worked. Some really haven't worked. I had an idea uh, as, as, uh, that, that people shouldn't live in square boxes. So uh, this, was, this was back about 15 or 16 years ago. And, uh, uh, well, I had the idea long before that, but uh, it took my wife long enough to, uh, a, a, lot, a lot longer to earn the money so I could build this underground house. <laughs> uh, and essentially, I, uh, it was inspired by the igloo. And, and the igloo has just been uh, um, classified as one of the seven wonders of Canada, right? Did you know that? Anyway. Uh, our, our house was in there too, but you know the original got the got the vote. The, this is the underground house under construction. As I, I said, we'll just go through that fairly quickly. Uh, just a few shots of what it's like inside. Uh, it, it, it is actually quite energy efficient. You know, on a dull day, it, it's like that inside. You don't need the lights on, and it, it, and it, of course, once you get a few feet underground, the temperature only varies a few degrees annually, so it works well. And uh, just a few shots of it. Uh, also, another idea. I said, well, refrigerators are dumb. I've got an idea for a better refrigerator. And uh, that, that I designed 15 years ago, and it's now being put into production by a British company, so you might be able to get one. Um, somebody, I, I had an idea that Canada needed Stonehenge too, <laughs> because why go all the way over there? And then, st and then stand by the traffic that's going by. So this one, of course, built near Oshawa. We, and, and I, I went to the, to the local uh, quarry, car quarry, and it's made out of... <laughs> My sculptures out in front there, I wanted to tell you about them because uh, they were part of a piece I did for Expo 86. It was actually the centerpiece of the land transportation plaza. And uh, when, when uh, I, I met, went to meet, meet with the designers out there, they were saying, what, uh, what, what can you do as a vertical thing for the, the center of the land transportation plaza? And that was the day that actually Steve Fonio had arrived in Vancouver after running across Canada on one leg, following in the footsteps of Terry Fox. And I says, we got to have the de-evolution, the wheel legs are our best land transportation ever. So this was in celebration of uh, of legs, from wh whether they were animals or humans or whatever. And I was going to put the one-legged runner at the top, but they'd already built a monument to Terry Fox, and they didn't want a one-legged runner up there, so I put T Tina Turner up there. <laughs> legs. She's got the legs. That's my wife 32 years ago, because he's 32 now. <laughs> and uh, doesn't drool anymore. She, I built her this rocking chair because she was beginning to knit. And she, she had an idea. She had an idea. She would make leather clothes. If you, can, if you can knit leather, she cut it in long, thin strips, you can knit fur. So she invented a process of... She revitalized the Canadian fur trade. Now, some people might not like that, but it was done with beaver that are in great overabundance. So, um, it... it, uh, it uh, uh, it really worked, and uh, that's, that's Paula in 1976 with one of her first pieces, knit leather and knit fur together. We, we call that the Diana shot, right? <laughs> or the thistle shot, that's it. I had an idea I could learn to fly, but I'm, I'm colorblind. They wouldn't give me a license. 
So I had to run off a hill. This is my second hang glider because the first one, <laughs> first one didn't last long enough for a picture. <laughs> and because I lived on a very low land, I decided I'd better put a motor on it. And I, I had the right stuff. <laughs> uh. scariest flight of my life. <laughs> and I even landed it. Because, you know, in, in flying schools, they say, learn to fly $25, learn to land $5,000. <laughs> yeah, and I had an idea. I could learn to fly with birds. Uh, after three years of hard work, I figured out how to get birds to fly in formation with me and became probably the first human on the planet to be able to get up and fly with with birds, and this, this is an actual shot of it. It's not out of a Hollywood film, it's the true thing. But what it did, it gave me a, a vision of, of uh, these creatures in the air that uh, was really inaccessible before that. And uh, it really inspired a couple of great films, like The Winged Migration, and uh, because you could get shots like this of birds close up. It started with Canada geese, because they were Nobody really worries about them, so you can get... <laughs> Somebody else had the idea that because you could lead these birds in the air, perhaps you could show them a new migration route. And the fellow by the name of George Archibald and another fellow by the name of uh, Bill Sladen, uh, both involved in endangered species or threatened species, uh, particularly the whooping cranes, says, you may have discovered a way of restoring the whooping crane to eastern North America. And so away we went with that. Uh, I thought, what a wonderful idea. And uh, again, got involving a number of people with the right stuff. We, uh, over the past, uh, well, in 2001, it was going to be our first, first migration with whooping cranes. We'd, we'd done a lot of migrations with geese and sandhill cranes up to that point. So in 2001, we started out with baby sandhills, and uh, our protocols had all got Quite, uh, quite, quite serious, and we raised a flock of uh, whooping cranes in 2001 and flew them from Wisconsin to Florida. When I say we, there was a, there was a whole partnership that had, had become involved in this. And uh, th this is a sort of a one-minute version of the whole thing. Uh, the, the, sand hill I mean, the whooping cranes learned to go back to the place where they learned to fly. So we raised them over the summer, then in the winter, uh, in the fall, fly them south, uh, following the aircraft, and, and we wear, wear these costumes so that they don't get attached to human beings. Qu quite a bit of fun landing in Georgia wearing that costume. <laughs> Just to give you a, a, an image, an image of what these absolutely wonderful birds are like in the air. In 1940, there were 16 of them left. And uh, it, it's, so, it, so they've gradually come back. The one existing flock that migrates uh, in the west, there's about a, uh, just over 200 in that. And the flock that we've been working on between Wisconsin and Florida, when I say we, we formed an organization called Operation Migration. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's uh, as, as of this year, we have 60 whooping cranes migrating in eastern North America. It is the most successful reintroduction of a species <laughs> in North America. As John Christian says, it's the wildlife equivalent of putting a man on the moon. In 1997, there was a major uh, hurricane went through Central America, and everybody was talking about we can't get supplies out to these outback places. All the road infrastructure was down. They couldn't get helicopters down there. I said, if we had a bunch of those aircraft that we fly the birds with, we, can carry, we could get that stuff there. We just have to organize it. So I, I, I kept thinking about that. This is the kind of aircraft we fly. And uh, they, they, they can carry either a passenger or 100 kilograms. So if you've set it up right to carry 100 kilograms, uh, you could get supplies in. You could, all you need to do is get the aircraft there. And so I thought of a way of doing that. Um, th these are ideally suited. They're, they're short field performance, low cost in all areas, uh, highly portable. They knock down into small shippable packages, easy to fly. You can learn to fly one of those aircraft in a third of the time, a conventional stick and rudder plane. Uh, and you can carry 100 kilograms, and you've got a 250 mile 
range. So excellent uh, for that. Um, and my son Jordy did this little animation how it works. A C-130 lands with all these and disgorges these boxes, emergency supplies, pilots, aircraft, and they go together relatively quickly, within two hours. I wish they did it automatically like this. <laughs> but uh, th that is the way they do go together. And then this little pod goes on the bottom. Uh, carrying whatever it need, needs to be. It might be medical supplies, it might be communications. It might be a communications to get into a, a, a disaster zone. Uh, it might be food um, or water. <laughs> and the, the beauty of it is, because you can fly these things low and slow, you come in, you don't, la you don't have to land, you just go and back to be, get another load. All, all good in animation, right? <laughs> all good in animation. And then you go back for another load. I forgot to tell Jordy to take the package off on the way back. <laughs> uh. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> we've, we've been carrying on and doing a lot of research, and it, it has all worked. Uh, the, we, did this, we didn't want to do this from an aircraft to start with, so we set it up from the back of my truck, and last summer we did a lot of little uh, experiments, dropping off things from, from the back of the truck at 40 miles an hour, and uh, it all seemed to work fine. Uh, so the next thing, uh, I worked with an engineer down in New York State, and we uh, um, built a real aircraft that would carry this. So this is the first prototype. And this is the very first actual flight test and drop. And uh, you can see they do take off quite nicely. They are, they are really fun to fly to. Um, and so the very first drop here. Works fine. Works fine. So the, so the idea... The idea is to, uh, to start a worldwide network of, uh, of essentially kind of built on the same image as, as volunteer fire departments with these kind of aircraft all around the world and, uh, and then a central organization. And we're, we're making progress with it, but I'm looking for help, so if anybody can help me out on it, fine. We live in a very privileged society and we have a lot of responsibility and I think that a lot of people here with, have the ideas how we can fix that. Thank you.